Family mode. All right, thanks. Uh, and we're recording? Okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. My name is John Davis. I'm editor of MPA News and project supervisor for OpenChannels.org, the online forum on ocean planning. Also with me is Nick Weiner, project manager for Open Channels. He's handling the technical side of this webinar, along with Sarah Carr, who is coordinator of the EBM Tools Network, an alliance of leading tool users, developers, and training providers in ecosystem-based management. This webinar is co-sponsored by the NOAA National Marine Protected Areas Center, the EBM Tools Network, and MPA News. Once every 10 years, uh, protected area practitioners from around the globe gather for the World Parks Congress, an event to set priorities for the field of protected areas for the coming decade. The latest World Parks Congress was held this past November in Sydney and drew more than 6,000 attendees from 170 countries. Not all of those folks were part of the marine theme of the Congress, but the marine community there was arguably the most active of any, uh, with standing room only crowds for most of its talks. In today's webinar, Lauren Wenzel, Acting Director of the NOAA National MPA Center, Dan LaFoley, Marine Vice Chair for IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas, and Allison Greenberg, Senior Manager for the Promise of Sydney at IUCN, will present on coastal and marine recommendations and next steps from November's Landmark Forum. This is how the webinar will work. Our presenters will provide their PowerPoints, and the audience will see each speaker's presentation on your own computer screen. Then we will open the floor to questions from you, the audience, for the remainder of the webinar. We'll conclude the webinar about an hour from now. If you have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box that is on the control panel on your screen. We will be drawing from those questions throughout the question and answer session. All right, let's get started with the presentations. I'll hand it over to Dan LaFoley now. Do we have Dan? Uh, he is unmuted, so he should be able to talk. All right, do we have do we have Lauren? Yes, I'm here. Okay, um, good. I'm just going to see if Dan maybe muted himself on his side. Dan, we're not hearing you. Uh, he says he's not muted. So Mysterious. Uh, well, Lauren, do you want to continue then, and then we can just uh, have Dan rejoin the webinar? Sure. I will go ahead and get started, and then, Dan, please feel free to jump in whenever you can be heard. Excellent. Thanks, um, Lauren. So, <clears throat> as John said, the World Parks Congress is held every 10 years, and it's really evolved over that period of time. And I think this graphic just illustrates the broadening scope of the World Parks Congress over time from a fairly narrow um, focus on the parks themselves to gradually expanding out to look at the broader landscape, the broader seascape, um, linkages across marine protected areas, and then the broader goal of sustainable development and a sustainable planet, which is really what we focused on in Sydney. Now my screen doesn't want to advance, just a second. And try, try minimizing it, Lauren, and then... Here we go. Yeah. Okay. So um, the real focus of the World Parks Congress was on this catalyzing transformational change and looking at the sub-themes of people, parks, and planet. Um, so the, uh, as you can see, these interrelated cogs, we're focusing on finding better and fairer ways to conserve natural and cultural diversity while involving people and responding to these broader planetary challenges of sustainability. And the way it was organized, there were eight streams, and you can see them here, um, all across the Congress, um, dealing with pretty much the fundamentals of protection for uh, or protected area science. And you can see here, we're talking about reaching conservation goals, responding to climate change, improving health and well-being. Yes. Ah, you can hear me. We can. So I will let you continue here, Dan. Okay, I don't know what happened there. We had it all set up perfectly, and then the system must have reset itself. Anyway, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'll just continue with this, uh, this opening uh, section. So we, we're organized in, uh, in eight streams, uh, reaching conservation goals, responding to climate change, 
improving health and well-being, supporting human life, reconciling development challenges, uh, enhancing the diversity and quality of governance, and respecting indigenous traditional knowledge and culture and inspiring a new generation. Um, we also, uh, alongside that, had uh, four cross-cuts. So we can move to the next slide. It's, it's being a little stubborn about advancing slides. Let me see what I can do. Okay, there we go. So uh, four cross-cut themes, uh, mar marine, world heritage, capacity development, and a new uh, social uh, compact. I think for us, um, it's been a major achievement in terms of uh, the scaling up and visibility that uh, was achieved by marine, but it also uh, has been very, very challenging to deliver that. So one of the things we had to do is, in effect, form a relationship with each of the eight streams as well as the other three crosscuts to make sure that marine was adequately represented uh, within uh, all those areas. And that took uh, quite an effort. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll explain a little bit about how that was done. So we had a marine crosscut management team. Uh, volunteer organizations that joined IUCN uh, and WCPA Marine to make this happen. So uh, NOAA, uh, the Great Barrier Reef Authority and the Department of Environment of the Australian Government. And the planning, to give you an idea for this, the planning uh, started a year and a half before. And uh, by the time we were actually um, uh, running up to this, we were meeting virtually every week, virtually on video conferencing. Um, across these countries, so late at night, early in, uh, early in the morning, midday, to try and make this whole thing happen. And uh, I would just at this point give a, a great personal thank you to uh, the, uh, the team that we had that enabled us to deliver at the scale we did. Uh, next slide, please. I think one of the things that we set up quite early on was a simple framework to help us think about the promise of Sydney. And Lauren's going to come on and talk about uh, that in more detail a little later. But we effectively created a, a simple framework to try and communicate some of the areas that we hoped we would uh, both have recommendations but also inspiring solutions in. So it was about protecting more. It wasn't just about the Aichi targets. It was starting to think beyond that, starting to, uh, to promote some of the thinking we might need. Uh, 2020 isn't that far away. It's evolving more. It's about connecting people and places. We've got much more yet to do there, many more dots, even with our own community, let alone outside, to bring people together. And investing more in terms of how do we invest in both the people and the places. So this simple framework enabled us to start uh, communicating well before Sydney in terms of uh, gathering together ideas and thinking. Next, please. So, uh, we, uh, on the 12th of November, it all came to, uh, to pass that we ended up in, uh, in Sydney at the opening of the Congress. Next slide, please. And just to give you an idea of what was achieved, uh, the original idea was perhaps we might get 3,000 people there, where well, we ended up getting uh, over 6,000 people, uh, which surpassed everyone's expectations, 170 countries. Uh, we actually ended up uh, with uh, uh, well over 200, in fact, uh, around 225 marine uh, and marine-related sessions, uh, of which 136 were purely marine-focused. Uh, we had around uh, 54 events in the pavilion, 23 side events, uh, five Google Hangouts, and four lunchtime debates. So we tried to look at this time round at a much more ambitious scale to give uh, space for people to have voices in all the particular issues they wanted to talk about, and also looked at a range of ways in which we could do this. Next uh, slide, please. It also wasn't about uh, just what happened inside the venue. It was also celebrating and bringing messages to the Congress as well. And perhaps one of the, the most inspiring things that, uh, that I, I certainly saw, and I, and I know it, it touched many people, was the, uh, the Vakas uh, coming from Kiribati, Cook Islands, uh, Palau, uh, bringing messages uh, to the, uh, the Congress. Next slide, please. And they sailed over 11,000 kilometers to, 
to, to deliver really a simple message that the ocean may be vast, but it's not limitless and it needs protecting. So very much in the, uh, in the, uh, the core message of what we're about with this Congress. Next slide, please. It was also about, as I mentioned, uh, new approaches, new technology. So we teamed up with, with Google and the Catlin Seaview. Uh, and uh, before the Congress, well before the Congress, uh, we actually uh, worked with them to encourage them to shoot underwater street view uh, for a number of locations around Sydney, up to 10 sites. So at the Congress itself, we, uh, with them, provided a platform for Catlin Seaview, the University of Queensland, Queensland and Google, to launch underwater street view for locations uh, throughout uh, Sydney Harbour and the surrounding area, Bondi Beach, Manly, uh, Chowder Bay, Shark Point, so that people not necessarily at the Congress could get a new perspective on why it was important to care for and look after the, the ocean. Uh, next slide, please. It wasn't just about uh, what happened at Sydney. We also, with them, provided a forum to uh, launch the largest photographic record uh, produced uh, on a single event for the Barry Reef. So uh, 110,000 shots in panoramic view of the Barry Reef, uh, covering uh, 32 reefs, covering uh, 2,300 kilometers of the Barry Reef. Uh, and all this is now available as a legacy from the Parks Congress. Next slide, please. It was also about the pavilion. So we, uh, we were bold in our approach to the pavilion. Uh, for those of you who were there, we had a much more open plan pavilion than others. Uh, and we're grateful to our partners to help fund that, the French MP Agency, the Canadian Wildlife Federation, Blue Solutions, uh, Parks Australia, amongst others. And this enabled us to really have a massive uh, social venue and certainly, uh, we ended up kind of blocking some of the aisleways by the crowds that gathered around the pavilion as a, as a hub uh, for, for both presentations, uh, but also, next slide, please, for, for other activities as well. Uh, next slide, please. And even in some cases, uh, as in this one, flying a, uh, a quadcopter, NASA's quadcopter, uh, inside, uh, showing off uh, the technology that can remove the sea surface to enable us to see an unrippled view of coral reefs and build three-dimensional models of coral reefs to uh, help uh, resource mapping management, management. Next slide, please. It was also about uh, uh, providing a, a forum of venue for testing new approaches. Uh, we persuaded Google to make this uh, one of their, their biggest um, uh, conference events of the year. And with the hyperscreen they bought, uh, we were able to provide um, a location for partners uh, such as SkyTruth, Google, and Oceana, in this case, to show off the global prototype of a fishing watch project, which will enable people to see the scale, intensity, and distribution of fishing uh, on the world's oceans, and be able to query this and see what uh, large uh, fishing vessels are fishing in particular locations. Next slide, please. It was also about uh, reaching out in new ways. So it wasn't just about who was at Sydney. It was about reaching out beyond Sydney. So we uh, organized Google Hangouts. We had five Hangouts, including a live seahorse hunt in uh, uh, Sydney Harbor, championing the high seas with Richard Branson on it from Necker Island, locally managed marine areas, giving voice to that part of the community, going big with ocean protection, which is the slide you see here, and also uh, having a discussion about uh, what was working on the, uh, the Barry Reef, the Great Barry Reef, what works. Next slide, please. Working on it. Hang on. So this forms part of the, uh, the uh, legacy. Uh, that we have, so these Hangouts are available online, as is uh, the material that was shot from uh, the Ocean Plus TV. So this was something that we uh, had worked with the French MPA agency over for Impact 3, and this seemed to be a very successful formula. Uh, so they very kindly uh, provided Ocean TV, a daily magazine program, 
that provided coverage of some of the big stories and interesting stories that occurred each day at Sydney. And with that, I think I'll hand over to you, Lauren. Okay, thanks. I don't know why this is being a little stubborn about advancing. Okay, um, so we just also wanted to give a shout out to our colleagues at Parks Australia who did an amazing job in helping us plan the event and also uh, on the marine side, but also were the hosts of the entire World Parks Congress. And, and it really was a, a great event and a great showcase for all the wonderful things going on in Parks Australia. Um, Another piece uh, that is also a component of the Promise of Sydney were some high-level political commitments that were made at the Congress and leading up to the Congress. Here you can see the President of Gabon who announced that 23% of that country's EEZ will be a network of marine protected areas. And on the right you can see uh, U.S. Secretary of the Interior Sally Jewell and President of Kiribati, uh, President Tong, signing an agreement to collaborate on MPAs in the Pacific. So these are just two announcements that were actually a whole raft of announcements that were made, and, and there's a list of them on the Open Channels website uh, for anyone who wants to go back and take a look at those. And so there was a lot of press coverage about these pledges and what they meant for the world ocean, uh, which was really great to get that word out in, through the media. And then uh, Dan mentioned briefly the um, lunchtime debates. We wanted to make sure that there was time to really have discussions about some of these bigger picture issues and questions. Um, one example is, are marine protected areas in the right place? So that was one of the topics of our lunchtime debate, which was then later uh, also promoted on this blog. Um, and there were a variety of, of lunchtime debates, including um, questions about the management of the Great Barrier Reef, and questions about how to promote a collaboration and support for marine protected areas across the land and the sea, and a variety of other topics as well. It was also a great opportunity for people to have side meetings so that uh, folks who were attending the Congress but were part of other organizations could take that opportunity to meet. So this is the Big Ocean Network, which are managers of very large MPAs that get together to share um, their experiences and develop best practices for how to manage these very large MPAs. Uh, one example is the Papahana Mokuakea Marine National Monument and the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, as well as uh, larger marine parks such as the um, Chagos Islands and uh, others around the world. So uh, this group met and has uh, been working on some guidelines for very large MPAs that will be coming out shortly. And then this was also a side meeting of the Marine World Heritage Sites, which also met in Sydney. So what I wanted to do now is switch gears and talk a little bit about the recommendations coming out of Sydney. And before getting into the substance of those, I wanted to talk a little bit about the process. Um, the Marine theme felt really strongly that uh, we wanted to tap into the experience of the Marine community and hear from folks about what they thought should be in these recommendations. So we've really made an effort to reach out to the broader uh, Marine community throughout the process of planning for Sydney. Um, there was a briefing back in June of last year to talk about um, just ramping up for the Marine theme. And then as we got closer to Sydney, um, we did a lot of outreach to the NGO community about what recommendations should come out of Sydney, um, and then also held a webinar specifically about that to get uh, people's thoughts and to fill them in on the process. And then, of course, all of the marine sessions at the World Parks Congress, as, as all the sessions were, uh, were uh, had note takers there, uh, rapporteurs, who were capturing some of the main points at all of the sessions. And then, of course, as you saw from that picture in the pavilion, there were a tremendous number of informal discussions, um, you know, throughout the pavilion and the sessions, you know, on many of these questions about where should we be going as a global marine community. And then finally, you know, following the Congress, we had a good solid draft of our recommendations, and we did have some email follow-up with a lot of individuals to talk about um, further refining some of the 
questions and comments that people had. So there's been a lot of exchange around these, and we are now at a place where they're finalized, and we're going to be talking now about how do we move forward in making these recommendations happen. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview. I'm not going to go into detail about the wording of all of these, but these are all online. I'll make sure that you get the URL. And if any of you want to talk about them on this call, we do have the detail behind all of these. And we can uh, answer any questions you may have about these. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to give you the big picture. So the recommendations covered, uh, the first, increasing the ocean area in MPA. So this is the spatial target around MPAs, and the goal here was to build on the commitment that had been made at the Durban World Parks Congress, which called for up to 30% protection, and really look at uh, a visionary aspirational goal for coverage of marine protected areas in the ocean, uh, which, which ended up being a 30% target. Um, the second goal was really very closely tied to the first. We heard from a lot of people, you know, you can't just talk about the spatial coverage. It's a very incomplete picture. You need to talk about management effectiveness. And even though we and the internal MPA community know that, sometimes it's a message that's not getting out sufficiently to the broader world that we work with. So there was a really strong interest in making sure that we emphasized management effectiveness in conjunction with this issue about spatial coverage. The third recommendation has to do with how we need to integrate MPAs into the broader seascape. Uh, there were some sessions on that in Sydney. Um, and the fourth, on including MPAs as part of the solution for climate change impacts. So looking at uh, existing processes and commitments, climate change talks, and making sure that oceans and marine protected areas were part of those discussions. Um, really tapping into ongoing international negotiations. Uh, also with the fifth, I would say that that issue of tapping into ongoing international negotiations was a theme for recommendations four, five, and six. Um, protecting the high seas, there was a strong interest and recommendation that there be an implementing agreement to protect the high seas under the UN law of the sea, which is something that's in discussion now. And Recommendation six has to do with making sure that oceans are integrated when we talk about sustainable development. And as we go through this UN process of developing sustainable development goals, keeping oceans in mind and making sure that they are part of the solution. Seven has to do with uh, preventing illegal fishing and detecting it. Um, eight really came out of a focus on ecosystem services. I think. There was a really interesting exchange across the Congress about a more traditional view of MPAs for ecological benefits and the traditional conservation perspective and the complementary perspective of looking at ecosystem services and the benefits of marine protected areas for uh, recreation, disaster risk resilience, uh, other types of fishing, food security, other types of benefits and how can we start to look at mapping those benefits and designing MPAs uh, with those benefits in mind. So a really a complementary perspective on the human side of marine protected areas. Uh, nine has to do with strengthening public support for marine conservation uh, using technology as well as other techniques. And ten was really looking at how can we develop more innovative partnerships with business both to help with the sustainable financing of marine protected areas, but also taking advantage of businesses' expertise in things like data gathering and analysis and marketing and things where the conservation community may not have uh, great expertise, but the business community can really contribute. So that's the, the big picture overview of the recommendations, and that's a one component of the Promise of Sydney, which Allison is going to give you the rest of the picture so you can see uh, how that fits into the broader set of commitments going forward out of the World Parks Congress. Um, did want to note that the, the issue about spatial coverage was a hot issue and did get some media coverage. I think folks were very interested in that. And also wanted to note, and I think John noted this at the beginning and also Dan, that oceans really did come into their own at this meeting. I think in the past, oceans have been a part of the World Parks Congress, but they 
were um, very well recognized uh, at this meeting in terms of their critical importance for the health of the planet and the health of the people who, who, who live in coastal communities. And uh, I was really encouraged and uh, cheered to see that when National Geographic was listing their take-home messages from what they learned at the World Parks Congress, their number one take-home point was protect the oceans. So this board was displayed at the, uh, at the opening entrance of the exhibit hall, and uh, I think it really just speaks to the energy and diversity of the folks there and the millions of things that were going on every day. And so I just wanted to, to share that to give you a sense of the, um, the 20 different directions that we were all being pulled in, but also the great energy and opportunities that we saw being able to participate in this, in this great event. So what I'm going to do now is hand the, uh, the microphone over to Allison so she can talk a little bit more about the Promise of Sydney and also where we go from here. Great. Thanks, Lauren and Dan. Um, can you hear me, first of all? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, terrific. Hi, everybody. Um, if, you, if I haven't met you already, I'll just quickly introduce myself. I, am, um, I work for IUCN's Global Protected Areas Program, and I'm the project manager for um, my, my role is to manage the process of developing and implementing the Promise of Sydney, which, um, as Lauren and Dan mentioned, um, comprises the outcomes and aspirations from both the 12 themes and streams of the World Parks Congress and also the global conservation community. Um, the um, Promise of Sydney, um, as both, um, both Lauren and, and Dan have noted, in the past is a package, um, which you, the package you can see in front of you, it doesn't look so exciting in, in that respect, but um, the, the, the role of the Promise of Sydney is to, has been and continues to be to coalesce the best thinking around the world on what will it take for protected areas to assume a more central role in, within the world's sustainable development agenda so that their position to fulfill their potential as resources for both biodiversity and the suite of other things that, um, that they bring, um, health benefits, um, other development um, benefits. Um, and to do this in the context of several global um, policy events that are coming up over the next couple of years and in the context of the, of the significant and stark realities um, of financial crisis, climate change, poverty, et cetera. And so that's the kind of big picture of this um, Promise of Sydney. Um, but just the four components of it, um, to review quickly, the vision is basically the high-level framework for looking at the rest of the, um, the, uh, the Promise of Sydney. And it's a two-page document. Um, it says three pages there, but we've brought it down to two pages um, that really outlines three areas of focus for the parks community, parks and protected areas community moving forward as we try to integrate protected areas into the sustainable development paradigm in the 21st century. Um, and just so you know, all of these are available at worldparkscongress.org. So you can go, um, even as I speak, and look through those or later. Um, if you go to worldparkscongress.org, um, in the middle, you'll see the Promise of Sydney. You click on that, and it will take you to these four components. Um, the innovative approaches, um, each of the streams and themes uh, created these. And these are basically recommendations that are based on um, new and old ideas of what works um, for how we can um, secure a firm place for parks and protected areas um, within this, um, this global paradigm. The, um, your, um, the innovative approaches contain a number of components, but most importantly, these recommendations that Lauren mentioned to you. Um, and I have to salute Lauren and Dan and Kiara and your whole group because They've been conducting these consultations within the community, um, within the marine community, and outside the marine community to really, you know, get to the truth um, of the matter. And so these 
um, the recommendations coming out of Marine in particular reflect an enormous amount of consultation and, um, and guidance seeking um, on their part. And so thanks to all of you who've contributed to that. Um, and these basically set out the goals, these recommendations set out um, some really aspirational goals for the next 10 years. Um, these were created as theories initially um, before the World Park Congress, leading up to World Park Congress, as Lauren mentioned, and they were reviewed and revised um, during the World Parks Congress with deliberations, um, based on deliberations from the, um, the group that was there, and now they're finalized, and again, they're, they're online. Um, the commitments, the third component, um, as Lauren noted, there were some pretty big commitments that were made during the World Parks Congress, very exciting. We'd like to consider that an initial round of, of commitments and definitely the door is open to securing more. Um, and these came from both governments and NGOs and individuals and, and just a range of organizations. Those are still being compiled and they're being um, uploaded onto the online as they come in. Um, and then fourth, um, very importantly, the Inspiring Solutions Exchange. That's um, uh, um, sponsored by the Global Environment Facility and it's basically um, trying to compile um, online the best solutions that um, innovative people have come up with to um, to surmount the challenges that they've been um, they've been faced with at the level of parks um, and protected areas and so they're not um, meant to be just protected areas um, planning solutions or implementation solutions, but it's how did you surmount a, cha a policy challenge to getting a protected area um, known, or how did you um, surmount a, um, um, a challenge to getting license for indigenous people to be recognized in protected areas management, et cetera, et cetera. So these are very exciting and, and there were many of these solutions um, articulated at the World Parks Congress and there have been additionally since then. Um, and so in a in whole, this is the, um, the package um, and now the question is, how are we going to activate this package? Um, and so basically where we are right now is um, finalizing the documentation um, and the first round of commitments, as I mentioned. Um, and I'm going through a process on behalf of IUCN for aligning the goals that um, what we call recommendations that came out of each of the streams and themes with the actual commitments, um, basically a mapping exercise um, in order to see where the big gaps are, where, they, where the, um, the implementation gaps remain, where are we covered. Um, we'll, come, um, we'll finish that over the next couple weeks. And then in two weeks, IUCN is going to begin its um, deliberations to define um, its program, uh, its next program of work, um, which are, these are four-year programs of work that will be unveiled at the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii in 2016. And um, what we're trying to do here with respect to the Promise of Sydney is under, is define, begin to define where the, where the IUCN will take on specific components. Um, with respect to marine or any of the other themes and streams and where we act, where we need to have others come in and fill those gaps. Um, and then what we'll do after that in February is begin to sketch out an action plan for implementing these, um, uh, these recommendations um, and making sure that we're tracking these. So we're going to get together with the leaders of the marine theme, Lauren and Dan, and, um, and sketch out what that looks like and um, the most, and, and, and very importantly is, how are we going to activate this? So um, just a, a quick plea to all of you to think about what your role can be um, within this context because we need all hands on deck. And I am going to stop there unless Lauren or Dan have anything else that they'd like me to address. Um, but thank you for having me. So I will just go ahead and finish out the last couple of slides here. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Lauren. 
once again, my computer is being stuck. Mm. Let me just, here we go. Uh, I think Allison mentioned the, uh, the URL to reach the Promise of Sydney documents, but here is the website here if, uh, for anyone who uh, wants to go ahead and take a look at that. Um, worldparkscongress.org slash about and then Promise of Sydney, or you can just click on it from the main page. But as Allison mentioned, the, doc the vision document is there. And then uh, for each of the streams and themes, there is the, the recommendations document called Innovative Approaches that you can also find online. So you can take a look at all of those. And then I also just wanted to highlight uh, that there are going to be some major marine events coming up uh, that we view as stepping stones for advancing some of these recommendations and some of the ongoing dialogue. Uh, there's going to be our Oceans Conference um, in October 2015 in Chile, the World Conservation Congress that Allison mentioned in September 2016, and then the International MPA Congress in November 2017 also in Chile. So we're definitely viewing these as milestones to help us push the agenda forward. So we'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions and discussion. Thanks, Dan, Lauren, and Allison. Uh, again, this is John Davis, MPA News Editor. Um, we now open the webinar up to the audience for the next about 23 minutes. If audience members have a question for our presenters, you can submit it in the question box that's on the control panel on your screen the webinar control panel, and we'll be drawing from those questions throughout this Q&A session. Um, question here uh, with, re with regard to uh, recommendations from the, the different streams and themes. There was not direct coordination among the streams and cross-cutting themes at the World Parks Congress when it came to drafting your respective recommendations, and at least partly as a result of this, uh, stream one on conservation targets avoided uh, including a specific percentage-based target for protected areas, whereas the marine theme called for 30% uh, no-take protection, as, as you've noted in your presentations. Uh, in your opinion, which recommendation should take precedence for the ocean and why? Boy, that's a great question. I will take an initial cut and then I invite uh, Dan to, to also weigh in. I guess I would just say, yes, as a practical matter, we did uh, have an opportunity to read early drafts of all the stream and theme uh, recommendations, but then uh, at the Congress itself, things were moving very fast and it wasn't possible to track everything that was happening at once. So we did have somewhat different philosophical approaches to some of these discussions, but at the same time, Within Stream 1, there were folks who, uh, who were discussing concepts like nature needs half. So the idea of spatial targets was certainly uh, discussed within Stream 1. So I think what I would say is I really defer this to the, the action plan. There may be places where spatial targets make more sense and where they don't. I think the marine community felt it was important to honor the commitments that had been made at Durban and try to move the ball forward and that spatial targets were a good way of doing that. Um, but we're going to be looking at the practical steps of making these things happen um, and not just focusing on the number. Yeah, it's, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. So basically, I don't think they're, uh, they're, they're wholly incompatible either. The, uh, the Nature Needs Half is very much about the broader context of protect protection. Uh, we were talking about specifically uh, strict levels of protection, no take. Uh, I think also we need to bear in mind that there are, there are, there's a couple of a aspects to this, one of which is the kind of aspirational stuff we may talk about at congresses like the, the World Parks Congress, but also there is the kind of operational side of things that this needs to kind of inspire and feed into, which is a debate that we will be going to have um, in the coming uh, major events, uh, particularly from Hawaii and from Chile which is looking beyond the operational targets around um, uh, 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 target 11, the HE targets, um, uh, which talks about 10%. So they're not incompatible, these two things. Uh, we'll see how we can bring some of those things together. But we also need to be focusing for the future 
uh, looking at the operational side as well. That's great. Thank you, guys. Uh, a quick question about the recommendation to increase ocean area in MPAs. How much discussion was there at the meeting and leading up to the recommendation about the need for spatial slash ecosystem slash habitat representation in meeting the 30% no-take goal? There was a lot, and there was a lot of views from loads of different angles um, over what we should be doing with that. Um, and uh, the, I think uh, were concerns expressed that if you just have simple targets which don't uh, dictate anything, you get into the area of kind of dangerous targets that you just put, you just count numbers if you like, whereas there were strong views over the fact that we actually needed to be looking at uh, location, uh, ecosystem type, uh, ecosystem services as well. Uh, with, all, with all these things that you end up, I think, with uh, the, the, the most, the, the balance most best view you can come up with, bearing in mind what we said at previous congresses. But certainly, uh, there is a, uh, a, a need for, to look at uh, this functionality, these, these services within these targets. Excellent, thanks. Uh, please explain if the Congress assessed how promises made at the previous Congress in Durban were kept or not. Uh, specifically in regards to MPAs, I take I take the, that mention of promises to mean the the overall promise of Durban or whatever that that statement was called, but I suppose it could also mean promises made by politicians at that Congress about their own national commitments. So if I uh, take a lead on that, um, perhaps Lauren come in. Uh, so there were commitments made at uh, Durban that were absolutely followed through. Uh, this was where we start, first started talking about high seas conservation. This is where we started to first start to talk about uh, doing stuff about marine world heritage, not just ha world heritage on its own. And, and everyone will have seen the, the tremendous blossoming in just those areas. Um, the, the, the way the messaging was uh, encapsulated at Durban was in something called the Durban Accord, which was perhaps, a, a, if you like, a, a, a less structured approach than we have this time round. Uh, it's where we, we set uh, um, principles like 20 to 30 percent of each habitat under strict protection, um, uh, observations about what we needed to do about uh, illegal uh, unreported fishing, etc. and so forth. Um, so, so where there were strong commitments, a number of them definitely have followed through, but also it was in my, my book anyway, personally, some of it was more about kind of assisting some of the principles than perhaps uh, the, the direction we've now taken, which is about promises and inspiring solutions. Lauren, do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think you've covered it well. All right, thanks, you guys. Um, question, what is the legal binding stature of the recommendations? And they're, obviously, they're not legally binding, and you guys can, can talk about this more, but what, what kind of authority do these recommendations have? It is a statement out of the, I mean, Alison may be able to answer this better than me, but my understanding is that these are a, a, a statement coming out of the Congress. They, they don't have, in a sense, the, the sort of... Uh, the, the, the gravitas and binding nature of resolutions. So we have an entire resolution process that, uh, that drives, for example, the business of IUCN through World Conservation Congresses. It, it's, not, it's not done in that, in that context. So they are a different beast to that. But I don't know, Alison, whether you want to make a comment on that? Hello. Oh, OK. I think I'm unmuted now, but no, I don't. Dan, that was exactly right. These are not binding um, recommendations. Um, and I would say that the goal is really to get these recommendations now pushed up through government operations and processes so that they become binding. All right, thanks, you guys. Uh, we had a question asking for the UR, some of the URLs that have been provided for the Promise of Sydney and, and for uh, being involved in the, in the process going forward. Perhaps we can get some of those URLs on screen uh, so that people can, can jot them down or um, cut and paste them if, if that's possible. Um, 
question, can you expand on the recommendation which details MPA management effectiveness? And uh, is there any plan to, to uh, involve the IUCN green list uh, in bringing that to fruition? Lauren, do you want to put that one up? Sure, I'm going to switch gears. I can go back to this URL later. Well, let me just pull that up. So perhaps while Lauren's pulling that up, I'll tell you a little bit about the green list. Um, in fact, I think we have Sue Wells on, on, on uh, listening in. Uh, so Sue has been doing some uh, sterling work with us to actually try and look at uh, the whole situation with regard to the green list uh, and marine protected areas and uh, provide a basis for moving forward on that. And uh, we have a briefing note on that that we could certainly circulate uh, to uh, provide people with the context for it. Um, I think the, the idea ultimately with all these things is not really for Marine to do its own separate thing, but to actually see how we can work in within that. But personally, from my position, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of discussion still to be had uh, about how we, how we fully operationalize those types of things and move it forward. And also um, about how we get the, 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 the conversation going and the messages out much more broadly than, than we have so far. Yeah, I would just add that the green list is at a fairly early stage, but there are some marine and coastal sites, and we would be very interested in having a webinar just on the marine component of the green list and, and uh, to share you know, the status of that and learn more about it. Great, thanks. Uh, question on governance of MPAs and how much attention it uh, receives in, or lack of attention it receives in the province of Sydney, according to this question asker. Um, once again, this seems like a problem related to lack of coordination between different streams. Where is governance within the approaches and recommendations? Well, I can start on that, and then Dan, I welcome your, your jumping in. I think governance was really infused in a lot of the discussions. Uh, the word may not appear in a lot of places, but certainly the thoughts behind it were there. Uh, there was discussion about the absolute critical importance of a community-based approach, and there was a lot of discussion about high seas and about working within international governance processes. So I think we really looked at how decisions are getting made from the local to the international level and how to infuse uh, ocean stewardship into those processes. Uh, so again, I, I think it's maybe just a question of inserting it in a variety of places rather than having one recommendation on governance. I think it should be distributed across the whole thing um, as, it, as it does kind of infuse in various areas. But I also think if, if the, uh, whoever has asked that question, if they have inspiring solutions around governance and stuff, then uh, certainly uh, um, talk to us. This is Alison. Can I make a, a, an additional point here? Um, because I think your, your points are very good just building on that. Um, if you look at the vision um, of the Promise of Sydney, you'll see governance as very strongly articulated there as well. Um, and then you look at the governance stream um, uh, recommendations as well. They have one specifically on governance to conserve the high seas. Um, there, that's their number eight recommendation. And then um, finally, I'd say what the process that we're, um, we're in right now in terms of consolidating the, um, the recommendations from across the, um, the, the spectrum of streams and themes will also address that point because right now you can't um, it, it's very hard to hit each note on, um, on all of the recommendations because the recommendations are so diverse. So um, we're definitely going to be um, uh, placing governance in a very central position within the Promise of Sydney um, as we further um, consolidate and map. Great, thanks a lot. Um, when we have a chance, we can we can try to get the, the URLs uh, up on the screen. Uh, we have a couple more people asking if uh, how they can be involved in the work program uh, planning on MPAs. Um, it's great. We can take advantage of of that willingness here. Yeah. Uh, a question on uh, regional seas. Uh, considering the major role uh, UNEP regional seas programs and conventions play on uh, in ocean conservation, in particular through regional cooperation, was there any specific discussion on their role within the Promise of Sydney? So in terms of inspiring solutions, 
they should feature quite prominently. Um, and the, the, the recommendations we have segment it in a different way, if you like. So they're not regional seas based or open ocean based. They're based on, on particular themes and issues. So where that should come into its own uh, is in terms of how regional seas can offer inspiring solutions to address a number of the recommendation areas that we have. And I think, you know, we will get to that stage. As Alison says, we're kind of in, in, in process at the moment looking at the analyses just across the, uh, the, the innovative approaches, but we'll also need to look and see how we're, we can build on inspiring solutions and commitments uh, using platforms like regional seas to help deliver this in the future. Any other comments on that, Lauren or Allison? Not for me. Uh, this is a follow-on question, actually from Sue Wells, you mentioned uh, her name, Dan. Um, is there a process for harmonizing recommendations between the themes going forward? Perhaps this is a question for Allison. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Sorry, I was muted again. Um, so yes, there definitely um, is the intention of harmonizing the streams and themes moving forward. And the process I outlined is really an effort to an, take an initial stab at analyzing and um, um, really finding the common ground across them. Um, it was It's the best way we know how to do it short of trying to get um, at least 12, but usually it's, you know, ends up being 50 leaders of, um, of streams and themes together at the same time in a room. Um, they, they live across the world, so um, it, logistically very difficult. Um, so we're going to just take an initial stab looking across them um, to do this kind of, an, these analytics to, um, to, to look into harmonizing and then, as we mentioned, as I mentioned, get um, the individual streams and themes on the phone, um, um, and um, and have, and then and then start to group them um, at the same time. So that's the best I can give right now. Um, if you have any suggestions, uh, Alison, my mailbox is open. Yeah, Alison, could you say a little bit about the timetable for all that? I think uh, people might find it helpful to know, have a sort of vision over the coming months and year when when big pieces of this are going to happen. Yeah, um, so it's hard for me to say right now beyond um, the next quarter, honestly, because um, we need to really, I need to get a sense from IUCN of what the capacity is to, um, to support this um, moving forward. Um, and so, I mean, really all I can, all I can say is, you know, we'd like to start getting as I mentioned before, the streams and themes on the phone in February, that's the intention. And in March, try to group, you know, start these groupings of them. Um, and um, that's pretty much what I can offer right now. All right, thanks, Allison. Um, speaking of timetables, uh, one, one uh, thing that's not included in the marine stream recommendations is a uh, time deadline for the 30% no-take protection of the oceans. Uh, do you have um, a, a date in mind uh, for hopefully reaching that, or is this something that we could be working on for the next 50 years? So I think part of this goes to that broader debate that we need to have. We, we obviously have uh, a process running um, around the promise of Sydney and the, the kind of aspirational recommendations. But as I mentioned earlier, there is a, uh, another pressing debate that we need to have, which is what happens after 2020 um, about the 10% um, uh, target. And I think where I think this really needs to come into play is, is having that, that kind of ambitious feel behind things to look at what we then need to do uh, through the CBD and other processes to put in place um, a, uh, a, a new vision for how what countries should sign up to to do these things. I, I 
personally, sitting where I am, knowing what I know about the multiple stresses affecting the marine environment, uh, the direction of a lot of the indicators, we need to be doing this uh, in a very ambitious way and very soon. There wasn't agreement, which meant that we didn't really uh, weren't able to put a timeline, but I would be personally saying we need to be doing these things by, by 2030. Well, and just to add to that, um, 2030 was the original date that was discussed in an earlier draft of the recommendations, and then to be consistent and just in terms of, of the way the documents were being produced, there's a section called interim targets that actually assigns dates. And so the, the date is uh, linked to 2030 for achieving that 30% coverage in the, in the targets section of the document. But recognizing that that is very ambitious. Thanks. I, I was unaware of that. Thanks. Um, let's see. What's the, what are plans for the next uh, World Parks Congress? Uh, I know Russia offered to host it. <laughs> yes. Has there, has there been Whether a discussion? Alison knows any more than we know, but yes. <laughs> well, what I, the, the only thing I can say is, yes, Russia offered, and, um, and we're, we're um, we haven't, had a meeting yet to define where that next place is going to be, but um, what's pretty exciting is that there are um, many, quote unquote, mini Sydneys that are starting to be planned and, um, and conceptualized now. Um, so one in Austria um, this coming year, um, and I think Latin America is thinking of one, and Asia is now thinking about one, so there are these interim regional um, world parks um, efforts now that, that have been inspired. So we definitely want to keep you all up to speed, um, definitely, as this moves forward. And Allison, are those, our outcomes from those all going to be blended into your work, uh, your ongoing work with the Promise of Sydney, as well as outcomes from um, uh, development and climate fora and other fora that, that are kind of related to, yeah. uh, to marine goings on? So that's a great question as well, um, John, and I would say I'm going to defer that until after we have the, um, the program week in, in January. We'll have a lot more, again, information about that, but I absolutely think that makes sense um, to, to blend this all. Um, and again, you have other efforts coming out of the um, World Parks Congress that Mexico committed to hosting a, a climate change summit for um, protected areas that will include marine protected areas. So there are, um, there are a number of these that are going to come up and, and be available, um, and we definitely, um, of course, want to integrate them. I think and, and I just wanted to add one other item, which is that uh, in the U.S., the George Wright Society, which is an uh, association of protected area managers, holds a conference every two years, and their next meeting will be in April uh, this year in Oakland, California, and there will be several sessions devoted to reporting out and discussing how to move forward on elements of the Promise of Sydney, not just marine, but across the board. So that will also be an opportunity within the U.S. and, and for others, other countries as well, to join in the, that discussion. John, could I just add a couple of things? Um, the first is that uh, obviously the Parks Congress is a long way off, but as Lauren showed on one of the slides, we're already we're actually already in the initial planning for uh, Impact Four in Chile. Uh, these things take a lot of planning, and we're also starting uh, thinking about the planning around Hawaii too. So I think we need to be thinking uh, as a community about what are the what are the big things and themes that we want. Uh, the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii, I hope, will be the, the, the first ocean uh, congress, in a sense, given the location. And uh, Chile is obviously a massive of opportunity to further consolidate uh, sharing of knowledge and action on, uh, on MPAs. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention was the fact that one of the things that we've done um, in the last year or so is do a deal with Wiley. Um, and aquatic, the Journal of Aquatic Conservation. So at uh, the Parks Congress, we launched uh, a couple of hundred pages of peer-reviewed uh, information written by participants from Marseille that, that it was released and fed into the Parks Congress. And in a similar way, we are commissioning uh, groups of people who spoke at the, uh, the Parks Congress 
um, uh, in Sydney uh, to produce papers. This will include on, on MPA targets and all these types of things uh, that will then be released into uh, the, um, the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii. We will do one from, we'll then do a further uh, set of papers from the World Conservation Congress uh, in Hawaii into Chile and one from Chile into whatever the next thing is. So we will have an ongoing uh, basis to provide uh, members of our community with, with a peer-reviewed uh, soapbox, if you like, to talk about and share uh, new knowledge and information on all these different aspects that underpin the, uh, the promise of Sydney. So that is, that is underway even as we speak um, and we hope that that will give off further opportunities for, for debate, uh, particularly in peer-reviewed scientific literature. Many of the issues that we've been, uh, that, that, are, that are fundamental to these different aspects of the recommendation. That's great. Perfect. I think that's a nice way to, to wrap this up. And incidentally, um, along that line, Dan, we'll, uh, we'll be doing a series of live chats with you and Lauren and, and perhaps with you too, Allison, over the course of this year uh, on open channels where people can ask questions and get feedback on the promise of Sydney as it continues to be rolled out in practice. Um, uh, we, we didn't have time to get to everybody's questions today in this webinar, but thank you very much for, for all of your, your um participation, uh, audience members, and a uh, big thank you to Dan LaFoley, Lauren Wenzel, and Allison Greenberg for, for being our guests uh, uh, talking about the Promise of Sydney. Thanks. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.